Hello Patreons and welcome back to my channel. Uh, this video, if you can't tell already by what's up in the upper right hand corner over here, it's going to be a test equipment video and we'll be talking about uh, an arbitrary waveform generator or programmable signal generator or just SIGGEN uh, for short. And like all things, they come in various sizes with various capabilities okay uh, this one right here is definitely a hobbyist lower tiered uh, signal generator uh, with um, more reputable ones coming from say HP Keysight Ag Agilent whatever uh, at higher price lines but they also give you more capability um, this one made by Coolotron, which is actually a rebadged uh, Juntech, I want to say, out of China, uh, is only an 80 megahertz uh, signal generator, although it affords you some the ability to AM modulate, FM modulate, various modulations. Um, it's got tertiary function as a frequency counter, uh, several things that we'll cover in this video. But the uh, more reputable, more expensive ones can get into the uh, higher megahertz range, uh, well over 500 megahertz, up into the gigahertz range of two gigs or more, which depending on the alignments you're doing for the system under test, you might need something that has that capability. However, in general sense, in, in, uh, for my applications here and what I do in my lab, <laughs> as you see with like the uh, AM radio restoration videos, I only need to be able to touch the, uh, you know, uh, the lower end of the frequencies. Well, not super low end, but, uh, but the lower end, regardless of the frequency spectrum. And all that kind of gets into the subject of, well, what is a signal generator used for? Well, as the name implies, to generate signals, okay? And I primarily use them for, for two things. Uh, two types of signals, AF or audio frequency and RF or radio frequency. So I'm generating those two types of signals. Okay. Now, when it comes to uh, AM radio, well, with an 80 megahertz bandwidth, right? Being able to go up to those frequencies, that's, that's no big issue. Okay. However, if I was to use this signal generator for the FM frequency band, well, the operating frequencies on the FM band are substantially higher, so 90 megahertz and above, okay? And what do I mean by FO? Well, basically big F, little o, that's an operating frequency. So say you have your radio tuned to 99.8 FM, that is your FO, okay? No different than an AM radio, if I tune to 1600 kilocycles or 1600 hertz okay that is the fo of the radio station that i'm tuned to well similar principle applies when with rf is we do have this third thing called an if big i uh, big f which stands for intermediate frequency okay now intermediate frequency is still a radio frequency it's just a term used to describe to you that you've taken your RF and you've either heterodyned it with an intermediate frequency to produce, uh, you know, four potential outputs, one of which you select and uh, and decode your or extract your intelligent your intelligence off of, which is intelligence is essentially your audio. So for AM, I can use this signal generator for all AM radios, right? It's got uh, uh, well within the bandwidth of AM uh, operating frequencies and well within the uh, bandwidth of the AM of most AM radios uh, intermediate frequency which is 455 uh, kilohertz okay or kilocycles either one pretty in interchangeable so you can use either terminology but for FM I wouldn't be able to use this to do a bulk of the alignments because it just doesn't get up to that frequency range. However, FM uh, intermediate frequency is traditionally 10.7 megahertz. Well, since this can go up to 80, I can definitely hit the IF and modulate it with a one kilohertz tone via frequency modulation and I can at least perform those alignments. So in a lot of cases, if I, and eventually I'll get to doing some of those radios here on my channel. Um, but 
for a lot of those alignments, what I'll end up using instead outside the IF alignment, and you can kind of see it over here on the right hand side, this little box sitting right here with the antenna on the top. Uh, this is a short range uh, FM transmitter. Now I don't control the, the power output of this. I think it's two watts low, five watts high. Uh, selectable. I can control the uh, the amount of audio that is uh, frequency modulated onto the uh, carrier freak or the operating frequency via this knob here and then external audio plugged into here. But uh, if I have to do alignments on FM, most likely I'll be using that uh, to generate a signal. And then the antenna being up there radiated out at 2 watts, which is probably going to be a lot more than what I need, so I may have to figure out a way to dummy load that down a bit or reduce that uh, that the uh, RF level coming out of it. But uh, this would, would be used for that purposes, although with some pretty significant uh, drawbacks. Of course, that being over here, and I realize probably not the easiest thing to see based off of how this camera is uh, situated at my desk. But regardless, here goes the uh, the Cooler Tron CJDS98, which, like I said, is a rebranded uh, signal generator from uh, Junki or Junki or or whatever. Okay, and I've mentioned several times that I primarily two applications AF and RF. You know, that's that's what we're going to get into here. But uh, with any signal generator, you always want to be able to go to the manual, right? You have uh, connections that you can make here, okay? So these are input connections, these are output connections. Um, you know, if you're doing something, the tertiary function of this being a frequency counter or uh, external mod signal, more about that in a second, um, you don't want to blow the input, so you need to know the characteristics of this input and what is the max amplitude or voltage or frequency allowed into it so you don't exceed those things, okay? But uh, predominantly, you just get your manual and you kind of peruse over a couple things and you make sure uh, every, that you have a general understanding of its, of its functions. Now, I'm not going to go through this entire manual, but I will cover a few things in this video. Okay, just some general application of what you could use a signal generator for. As a matter of fact, it's stated obviously, well, you can use a signal generator in replace of anything that's generating a signal so much as the signal generator you're using has the capability of producing that signal. For instance, say you have a device under test that has a oscillator that generates a 1.2 megahertz signal at one volt peak to peak. Well, say that oscillator is bad, I could use this signal generator to produce a 1.2 megahertz signal at 1 volt peak to peak and output it through its connection into the device under test to prove whether or not that oscillator is bad or as a temporary measure to behave as an oscillator within the circuit. Okay, but that kind of goes into the into something that you have to consider whenever you're doing alignment or you're messing with electronics and you're using a signal generator. Like I said, I just came up with an arbitrary amplitude of, of one volt peak to peak. But I would need to determine in that device, is that one volt peak to peak uh, signal appropriate? Well, what if it only needed a uh, 100 millivolt signal? Well, one volt is definitely greater than 100 millivolts so I would have potentially saturated the uh, the circuit with a stronger signal than what's required I could damage the circuitry uh, as well so I only want to produce a a frequency at an amplitude that's required for the device under test so hopefully that makes sense but uh, let's get into this uh, signal generator just a little bit and uh, I can discuss a few things with you. Uh, we can do a, a tad bit of application. Suppose first things first, as I've always said, familiarize yourself with any guide or, or manual for it. Uh, this one is already uh, hooked up, per se, meaning I've taken the, the power cable, as shown here on page two, and it's plugged in, and the back is turned on, so all I have to do is press a button to turn it on. And then with this USB cable right here, uh, you can see it on this diagram, 
that uh, basically it's an old this uh, printer style USB cable that allows us to connect to software that is on my uh, workstation uh, over this way <laughs> uh, to control this remotely versus having to press buttons physically on it. Okay. Now I will say this: if you control it remotely, you'll see the changes reflected up on the display. But if I control this locally and make changes, I will not see on the software over at my desktop the corresponding changes. So keep that in mind. All right, general power up. Anytime you turn on a signal generator, uh, unless if you've gone into the software to turn it off from doing as such, you see how both of these outputs are on? You need to turn them off, okay? Now, there's a whole slew of uh, data out there concerning RF radiation hazards. And when that is on, it is currently generating, as we can see here for channel one and channel two, a 10,000 hertz signal at five volts peak to peak. Now that's on the lower end of our, of our frequency range. So it's probably not gonna be very hazardous even at five volts uh, amplitude, okay? But once you start creeping up there in, in power output and frequency, you start to create more hazards. Um, there are several theories concerning reproductive hazards. I can tell you firsthand, you can create a burn hazard, meaning if uh, these guys are not uh, off, they start to generate heat. And if you touch them, you can burn yourself. RF can burn yourself, can burn you. As a matter of fact, just getting into like microwave principles and stuff like that, well, that's a frequency that's being generated to cook food. Think about that for a second. So as a general rule of thumb and best practice, it's always best to turn your channels off and only turn them on as you need them. Okay. Now I have mine turned off and I've got my signal generator turned on. Before we start going into any practical application, let's first talk about the software. All right. When you turn this thing on, probably one of the first things you should do is go over to your help menu. Okay, you can see your system information. You can click on about, and it's going to tell you your hardware version, your firmware version, and your FPGA version. Okay, so it does give you some model number, part number information. Now, in your guide, they give you this... Uh, Direct link to download uh, CJDS98 underscore EN underscore setup dot zip a zip file that essentially is going to look something similar to this right here. And let me get to it. All right, there we go. Which you can extract to set up some software. Uh, you go to the English side application side and you, you would run this setup okay now i'm going back out of here for a second and we will turn that off but uh, once you get that software uh in, installed you can open it up the uh, run file and you'll get something that looks like this okay now basically what this is is this is the uh software the the uh, software they provide for you to allow you to connect to this click on port this is going to be the USB port it's attached to yours might come come up as com3 versus com uh, or com1 instead of com3 but if you but it should be able to detect which one you're going to use uh, you connect to it you click open you can see that gives you your uh, model number your serial number and then you've got your control panel okay and then you can see from this control panel, uh, including corresponding to our screen over here, I can turn on and off an output. I can come here and I can enter 5,000. Then I hit enter on my keyboard. And that changes the frequency on both the software and over here. And the same thing with the amplitude. Go from five to two. And we see that corresponding change up here. Now, if I was to do this on here, it would be frequency 10. Now I could hit kHertz, 
but you see it doesn't change me back on the software. Amplitude, five volts peak to peak. Again, it doesn't change what happens over here on the software. Matter of fact, I can't change it back until I've put in new data. So let's do 6,000. And now I can get a change. Two, three. There we go. So just some little things that you have to figure out here and there. Another thing I want to show you, I found this online going to the EEV blog, and this is why I say that, you know, this is a uh, rebranded June Tech <laughs> because that's essentially what it is. But uh, discovered on the, the blog their official website, and if we were to go to that website, and now it's loading up. There we go. Uh, Ooh, can I get this to translate to English? English, please. Thank you. All right. We can go to uh, products. Okay. Uh, JDS series. Can we find our specific product? Might not be in the right place. Let me click on function generators. Here we go. And we're looking for the JDS9 PSG9080. There it goes right here. And there's a lot of information that you can read through, although not if you're not cannot read in Chinese, you're not gonna <laughs> obviously not gonna be able to translate this very easily. Uh, I think what I'm gonna go to now is technical setup a download function generator. Again, we need to find our PSG 9000 is what it's showing up on here. So I'll click on that. And here goes the files that we can actually download. Now, what I've went ahead and done is I've upgraded my firmware. So I've downloaded uh, this bin file we see here at the bottom. Firmware upgrade bin file and then firmware upgrade software you need both of those things all right okay i just realized that a part of this i wasn't recording correctly so apologies that this is a bit juddering but from my download file i am going to open up or double click fw update 2 which we downloaded from that website okay and that will correspond to uh, essentially what you see here on the bottom left hand corner and then from there, I open up the uh, click open and it'll pull up a new window where I can select the bin file and I click open. All right. And then I'm going to select open port. You see, it's trying to communicate. Uh, no response. You can try the next port com three. Yep. Open port. And there we go. It's saying on and we see a corresponding change up, uh, up here to my SIGGEN. All right. And with that bin file selected, we're going to select run. You can see that the run in the software and up here with the hardware, uh, it's kind of doing the same thing. And look, everything went well. Upgrade is successful. I'm gonna select exit. All right, hit any key up here. I'm just gonna press the home key and it, now it's powered down, turn back on, is because with the original uh, firmware that was installed on here, um, let me exit out of this guy, hold on a second. Okay, with the uh, original firmware that was on here, I noticed that, um, yeah, I'm connected, that when I attempted to turn, uh, say, channel two off, it would turn on channel one. And when I turn channel one on and off, it would turn on channel two at the same time. So if I hit this one, they would both turn on, but when I click this again, only channel one would turn off and channel two wouldn't. So there was a bit of an issue with the uh, current firmware that was on it, but with this update, this seems to be uh, acting, behaving uh, a lot better. 
So I'm pretty happy with that. And this allows me for my PC to be able to record things and show it to you out over the internet uh, what I'm doing. Okay, that's the only reason why I have either one of these programs is, uh, is that way I can get it up on OBS Studio. And so you can physically see what I visually see when, when I'm playing up here, although I do it via the computer software. Now, what I've done right now, and you have to forgive me a bit because I had to turn the filters off of my uh, overhead uh, microphone, uh, so a lot more background noise can get picked up, which is what's needed in order for you to hear some of the things that I'm going to demonstrate. What I've done is I've taken a uh, BNC, uh, essentially this is a 50 ohm British Naval connector style um, connector right here jack connector whatever you want to call it plug and I put it into channel one and then on the other end of it are some alligator clips that I put to this uh, six ohm speaker okay and to start off with we're just going I've only got this up for a thousand Hertz at two volts peak to peak and we'll turn on channel one so you should be hearing a nice uh, 1k hertz tone coming out of the speaker currently well I can control the amplitude here by changing this adjust to amplitude and then we'll do our step up value as 0.1 so that way as I rotate this knob And you see that corresponding change over here as it increases in amplitude we hear that audible amplitude increase as well as a matter of fact you probably heard a click and that's just uh, you know as the device uh, is amplifying the the or increasing the amplitude of my sine wave here it has to select up different amplifiers in order to do that work And you probably just heard a click again so we'll uh, take this back down to you know roughly two volts but here you can see that frequency maybe we want to change the frequency well I can either type it in 800 enter and we have a different tone coming to the speaker or I can go to the software frequency same thing That's going to take forever. Why don't we change our value to 1? And I'll increase my amplitude just a smidge. And you should hear the frequency change as well. Pretty simple enough. One hertz, definitely too low for us to hear. What about 80? It's going to be in the subwoofer phase. Now I can physically feel the vibration here on the speaker or subwoofer frequency range essentially, but uh, it's kind of hard to hear at that amplitude. Now I get a low hum out of this. Not sure if the mic is picking up on that low hum or not.
There you go. Now, as a general rule of thumb concerning the audio range, we're talking about what uh, what the human ear can perceive. Uh, in traditional radio theory, your uh, transmit frequencies would be anywhere between 100. Um, well, we'll say 100 to 6,000 hertz. Okay, uh, modulating frequency, I guess, onto your FO, your carrier or operating frequency. And on the receive side, you're talking about between 300 to 3k. 300 hertz to 3k hertz reproduced at the speaker uh, basic radio transmissions um, maybe I misspoke a bit 300 hertz to 6k modulating intelligent frequency onto your carrier and then when demodulated uh, typically what's reproduced at the speaker is 300 hertz to 3k so that upper end is just cut out of there through uh, uh, filtering put it that way now your question probably is now, well, what do I use this application for? Well, you'll see in videos like the two-channel amplifier, uh, PA amplifier, I use this to generate an audio signal. So that way it can go through the amplification process internal to the amplifier and then produce a tone out at the end at the speaker. I did that for the two-channel uh, amplifier that I've repaired, as well as the uh, guitar amps. Uh, this device was used for generating my audio signal, okay? Or, you know, you can actually just also, if you have a uh, frequency generator, let's see, something like this right here. Of course, you're limited with uh, something like this on your phone. I just realized that the overhead LED was blocking up most of the screen. Um, you can produce a signal here and then you can. Uh, hook up and you know a phone will plug out and then connect it to whatever device but you're limited on the amplitude that is produced by your cellular device whereas we have significantly greater amplitude of our audio generating capability within the signal generator so I would encourage you if you're wanting to know how to make use of uh, the AF range uh, general application you know watch some of those videos on my main content on the YouTube channel and you'll see how I am apply it in regard to that fashion. And then on the output side of those amplifiers, I typically hook up my signal generator, not my signal generator, my oscope, as you see over here, and I make a measurement, right? And I'm looking at that waveform that's being generated here. Um, we can check it before, as I have it connected right now. My BNC channel one cable is going directly over to the input channel one over on my uh, signal generator over there which i know that at channel one the max voltage we can do is 400 volts so you know small things that you need to consider but uh um you know um right now we have a clean signal but let's pretend in our in our brain let's consider that this is going into the input of a uh, amplifier and the oscope is connected to the output right I want to make sure that there is no, and I've gone over this in the OSCO video per se, you know, I'm looking for the characteristics of my uh, signal, making sure it's not distorted, making sure that the uh, the frequency is correct. We see down here in the bottom left hand corner, we're producing a 408 hertz signal, right? Uh, if I turn on measurements and we can check the amplitude voltage channel one volts peak to peak there we go um you can see that's now there 4.8 volts uh peak to peak you know we we verify you know certain things with what we're producing versus what is the output and again even with this we can still see this uh frequency change as i increase my frequency you see how the starts to shrink so basically our wavelength is getting smaller as I increase frequency
much and much and much smaller. Easy enough. Then if I were to go over to amplitude, amplitude, change this to say 0.1. Now we can see how our amplitude changes as I decrease amplitude and increase it back. So I've covered um, oscopes in a different video, but you know, two handy devices to have your your signal generator, okay, and then your oscilloscope for making measurements with whatever you're producing via your signal generator and inducing that signal uh, into whatever device is under test, and then with the oscope measuring the output at whatever is the respected output okay but there are some other functions of this signal generator as well so i want to take us up into the uh, megahertz range so let's change our units from hertz to megahertz and we're going to do 10 megahertz Ooh, my uh oscope is wigging out there I don't know what was going on there. Perhaps some limitations uh, due to this also being a rather hobby oscilloscope. But uh, essentially, I, I needed to bring um, our frequency down a bit. So I brought it into the AM uh, radio frequency range, 1600 kilohertz, amplitude 1 volt. Uh, you can see it right here on the oscope. And as a matter of fact, if I spin it out, there goes the actual frequency. So 1.6 megahertz or 1600 kilocycles or kilohertz. Okay, and then we just uh, go over to modulation and there goes our 1k hertz signal. And we can see that modulated frequency showing up on the oscope. But my trigger is having a hard time getting it to stay steady. But uh, there you go, there's your AM modulated signal, which you can develop. Uh, you can change it from AM on here to FM. Yes, FM does look different. There we go. And if I was to actually spin it out, if you're to look at the entire signal, you'll see how that FM makes a change uh, to it. There are very good videos that explain the difference between AM modulation and FM modulation online. Okay. I thought with FM modulation, you're, you're basically uh, shifting kind of your uh, RF signal. And like I said, significant, uh, not overly significant differences, uh, but yes, very but yes, significant differences to different types of modulation, which uh, you can, you know, set up different types of modulation types here. But uh, I primarily just use the AM FM and then have internal selected up versus external. Yes, you could use an external source of modulation, which would be connecting an audio tone uh, to this external jack right here versus the one that's being generated internally. So that's kind of it so this would be more so on the rf side uh, what's a good application for that now you, for that you'd have to watch my radio restoration videos where i have the antenna of the radio uh, set up and basically i take the alligator clip to my generated signal i put a loop of wire around the gator clips connecting them in and then plug it up so now it's acting kind of as its own antenna and I drape that over the antenna of the radio. So it's acting as this is acting as a transmitter for the AM uh, radio receivers uh, to pick up on and demodulate. Basically, what a signal generator is, is essentially a, uh, a radio per se. Think of it as a transmitter. I could, by all means, uh, using this external audio function. So if I was to take this guy to here and plug it in and then if I wanted to if I 
you know, had this connected up to say a, a jack going to my phone playing a movie, I could transmit that movie out over the airways, not the picture, but the audio from that movie, uh, say over this AM signal here, produce a similar AM modulated signal, and then uh, I can tune up, say, uh, any local AM radio in my house and listen into that movie all from this signal generator being uh, sending out that signal. So what I would do instead of having this connected to my oscope, which is going to act as a dummy load, I'd give myself a BNC antenna uh, and hook it up to the output here. But uh, that's kind of it. That's uh, your two basic principles, audio and RF. And something I did not show you, and I probably should have done before, you know, showing a modulated signal, again, being produced by this SIGGEN here, which we looked at over on our scope. I've set our frequency to 1 kHz, two, uh, 2 volts, peak to peak, just making that the same. But, um, you know, you can change, obviously this is sinusoidal right now, Uh, let me make this change. There we go. And I'll change this back to one. Just make sure everything's tracking along on the software and what's showing up on the software and what's showing up right here. But anyways, um, there we go. Uh, you can change your waveform type via the software as well. Sign, square wave, pulse, triangle, ramp, CMOS, which is going to shift you to your, uh, you know, basically your your ground line, your zero volt line, and above. So. Everything alternates above there. CMOS typically clock type batteries, right? Remember, I've, I've mentioned this in several of my YouTube videos. Uh, you can use the SIGGEN to essentially create your your CPU clock signal, clock frequency. So say you have an IC within an older computer that generates a CMOS frequency of 1 kHz at 3 volts amplitude, but that IC is no longer outputting that. Well. You can use the SIGGEN and then connect it to the pin that it's going to, uh, say away from the IC, disconnect the pin from the IC, but on this via to whatever is looking for that signal, you could connect this onto there to generate that signal external to the IC that's developing it. You can set it up for just DC. Uh, half wave. Go, you see those corresponding changes. Full wave, post ladder, positive ladder, negative ladder. Which uh, negative ladder is is positive ladder. These are pretty good at low amplitude for checking out LCD displays, especially ones that have segments that uh, generate a picture that's supposed to be moving. You know, low level AC is what can be used to excite those crystals. Very low level AC. Don't recommend it unless you know exactly what you're doing, but that's how you would excite the crystals inside of liquid crystal display. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you see those LCD videos that uh, I've been working on and I put up those uh, segments onto the uh, O-scope over here to look at, you know, that's essentially what we're seeing, okay? Something like that. You got other things you can produce. But uh, one thing we haven't discussed was this uh, arbitrary function. So let me go back up to uh, sine wave. And is it under extended functions? No, I think it was just here on arbitrary. And then there's a way to Draw it on here. I'm trying to remember how to do that. Uh, give me a second and I'll come back. 
Okay, it took me a second, but remember how to do it. You actually go above your top menu. There's this little thing that says arbitrary, and then it pops up this menu right here. From here, you can draw a signal. Okay. You can write that signal. I'm writing the storage location one. And then you can see it now being generated over on the oscope. Now what I could do is I can multiply signals. So let's say that I decide that I want to add this to the signal right here. Here goes the first one, here goes the second one. We add them together, or we make multiple signals, or we subtract one from the other. Click on right. Now we have the signal that we developed being displayed over on our oscilloscope. Now, how is this important? Well, let's consider for a second, um, the um, remote controls I was working on, and remember they produced a PWM signal um, for IR uh, to control a TV or a device or something along those lines. Well, uh, maybe Perhaps I would use this arbitrary format to generate the exact uh, PWM signal that I wanted. Then I can hook it to a uh, LED that would transmit out that signal to the receiver side of our uh, IR, that receive LED, which would then decode it and make use of that signal at yeah, whatever device. Now, you can still see here over on the oscope, even though we've made that new signal, it's showing us that it's a 1 kHz frequency, but we can see how we've uh, changed it and how those corresponding changes, uh, what that's done to our frequency. So right now it's kind of telling us that we have a 2 kHz signal, even though we're producing a, a 1 kHz signal that we've altered um, the characteristics of it. So that's the arbitrary function. Again, there, there's a lot more to do with the arbitrary side of things. Uh, I have no general need for it. I, I don't mess with it that often. So I predominantly use my uh, signal generator for the AF and the RF uh, side of the house, audio frequency and radio frequency. So final uses and final thoughts and stuff, well, um, when we built our curve tracer, VI curve tracer, I made use of the signal generator and the oscilloscopes, uh, even though it's not showing up here anymore, XY function, uh, along with this device as well that we built, very simple uh, device. Uh, there used to be a pin in here. This was given to me while I was on deployment in this case. The pin dried up in ink, but now this is where I store that device that we made in the previous video. But um, yeah, it was, this guy was used in that application as well. Um, but you know, in a general sense, this is your uh, signal generator. It's there to pr produce a signal, uh, one that you desire for whatever alignment or testing that you're having to do on the device you have up on your bench or in your lab, okay? I uh, highly encourage uh, experimenting, but be on the safe side. The couple warnings that I, I gave you about making sure that it is turned off, and not just radiating out into the air, etc. But uh, that's basically it. Pretty simple device uh, with, with some decent functions uh, allowed with it. Uh, I didn't cover the external frequency counting function on this guy. Uh, I don't find it to be very accurate per se, not on a, you know, rebadge, uh, junkie uh, signal generator. Although a lot of sig gens do come with a frequency counter and they do work very well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, just not this one in my opinion, it's not incredibly accurate. Um, 
But that being said, uh, this is kind of, you know, the very basics of a signal generator. It's there to generate a signal. Uh, I've gone over a couple practical applications. Um, you, again, I pointed you to the videos where you can kind of see those things. Um, went over uh, how to change the frequency, how to set your modulation. We've heard our tone in our speaker. We've seen it over on the O-scope and that's pretty much going to cover this video. So with that being said, if you enjoyed this uh, very brief um, but somewhat in-depth uh, training video on the signal generator and its general principles and what it's used for, uh, please let me know by hitting the heart icon uh, over here on Patreon or leaving a comment in the comment section. Uh, that being said, thank you for watching, take care, and goodbye. Mark?